This is Duke University. Good evening, uh, and welcome to Conservatism in the Age of Trump with journalists Megan McArdle and Ross Douthat. My name is Fritz Mayer, a professor here at the Sanford School and director of POLIS, the Center for Political Leadership, Innovation, and Service, one of tonight's co-sponsors. We have a small banner here. Um, POLIS's mission is really twofold, to inspire and empower a new generation of political leaders, our students, and to engage the Duke community, students, faculty, staff, and alumni in addressing the problems that beset our politics today, tall order. Um, as you see from the banner behind me, we are celebrating uh, the 100th anniversary of Terry Sanford's uh, birth, uh, who gave, uh, uh, is the founder of the institute that now is the school that bears his name. Um, Terry would be uh, very pleased with tonight's event. Uh, he was, of course, far from a conservative, certainly for his time, but he believed deeply in the value of engaging with people who thought differently than he did, and he had the all too rare ability to find common ground with thoughtful people regardless of ideology. I know he would find much to agree with in what our speakers tonight will say. I'm gonna turn this over now to my colleague, uh, introduce my friend and colleague, Bill Adair, Knight Professor of the Practice and Director of the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy, who will introduce our speakers. Bill? All right, I wanna thank uh, uh, Join Fritz in welcoming you uh, to this great event. It's made possible by the generosity of Jack and Pamela Egan, uh, who have endowed Megan's position as the Jack and Pamela Egan Visiting Professor. Uh, that's a dual appointment of the Sanford School of Public Policy and the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. Um, uh, as you may know, Megan has been quite active on campus this, uh, this fall. She has been um, teaching uh, op-ed writing in the DeWitt Wallace Center and often meeting with students and faculty um, and uh, she generously offered to uh, organize and host this event, and we're grateful for that. Uh, a little bit about Megan. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania with an English degree, she spent four years at a boutique consulting firm building servers and workstations for banks. Uh, she realized she didn't quite fit in in the world of IT, so she got an MBA at the University of Chicago and became a blogger eventually working her way to positions at The Economist, The Atlantic, Newsweek, and The Daily Beast, and now Bloomberg View. Uh, she is the author of The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. Uh, if you haven't read her work for Bloomberg View, you should. It's smart and witty and has some wonderful insights. Uh, thanks to Megan, we are uh, fortunate to also have Ross Douthat with us. Uh, Ross grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, and is a 2002 graduate of Harvard University. He was a senior editor at The Atlantic before becoming a columnist for The New York Times in 2009. He is the author of Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics, uh, and Grand New Party uh, uh, with, how do you pronounce it? Is it? Raihan. Raihan Salam, uh, as well as Privilege, Harvard, and the Education of the Ruling Class. Uh, so the format tonight is wonderfully simple. Um, it'll be a conversation between Megan and Ross. Um, uh, and then at the end of that, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we're looking forward to a great discussion. So thank you to both of you for joining us. Uh, <laughs> So I got my start in professional blogging in the heady days at the Atlantic with, with Ross uh, when we were all running around, no one had any idea uh, what they were doing. And my, actually, in fact, the reason that I became a professional blogger was that Ross invited me to a dinner with David Bradley, uh, who owned the Atlantic. I did not actually know uh, who David Bradley was or really anything about Washington journalism and arrived 45 minutes late because I, had, I, was only in, I had been in Washington for like three days. And I told the cab driver to take me to the address, and I had no idea where it was. It turned out the cab driver had no idea where it was either and deposited me in the middle of a park 
<laughs> and I'm frantically trying to call Ross. That's, that's how we welcome people to Washington. <laughs> well, the best part Happened was... Happened to Jared Kushner and, you know... <laughs> I was frantically trying to call Ross and Raihan, uh, and of course they were at a very important dinner with David Bradley to turn their cell phones off so that they wouldn't. Um, and I arrived there, and uh, David Bradley, who is like the nicest person on the planet, personally made me tea because I was covered in snow and had been wet. Um, and almost all of the people who were at the dinner that night got hired as the kind of first class of bloggers at. Uh, uh, at the Atlantic, and I think the funny thing was because I'd arrived late and the introductions had not been made, for some reason I got the idea that James, this is a story has never been told before, for some reason I got the idea that James Bennett, the editor-in-chief of the Atlantic, was the IT guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was really good with computers. He was. So, uh, yeah. um, but it was uh, some of the best years of my journalistic career was working with Ross and having him wander into my office when I, when I was there which wasn't always, and, uh, and just sort of tossing off some incredible insight into uh, the state of conservatism, human nature, religion. Uh, and so I'm gonna to try to replicate that experience for us tonight, and I'm gonna start by uh, asking a question that I might ask you over a beer, Ross, which is, uh, you know, yesterday, big election day, uh, I think Republicans are feeling a little bit like, uh, in the words of Tom Lehrer, or Christian scientist with appendicitis. <laughs> Uh, what, what does it mean? Like, how bad, how bad was this for, for Republicans? For the Republicans? For uh, America? For yes. Ed Gillespie? A, a, any of For our questions. business? For what? I mean, yes. <clears throat> for the destiny of the human how race? Much should, how much should I buy in the way of canned goods and ammunition to store in our basement? Um, <clears throat> I mean, do you work for the Republican National Committee? I mean, do you... <laughs> I, I have been it, accused it of this, that, but The no. good thing about our profession is that what's bad for America, conservatism, the Republican Party, and the world is very good for us. So I think, you're, I think you're okay. You don't need the canned goods, <laughs> no matter what. Um, I, I mean, I, I feel like the election sort of confirmed that the laws of politics have not been permanently suspended and that um, a deeply unpopular Republican president will lead to negative outcomes for Republicans in states that are trending towards the Democratic Party. Um, and that, you know, I mean, I think somebody, I'm stealing this insight from somebody, but all insights in journalism are stolen ultimately, is that what happened in Virginia was sort of what most people expected to happen on election day a year ago, which is that um, the Republican Party sort of lost the suburbs in a big way and in a bigger way than they did in the, right. in, in the end in, in 2016. And that was what made the difference in this case between Northam being elected governor by what I think was reasonably expected to be a three or four point margin and the much larger margin he actually won by. It's also presumably what made the difference in sort of putting the House of Delegates in play in a way that people didn't expect um, so, so basically, to the extent there was a surprise, which wasn't, shouldn't have been necessarily a surprise, but it, it was that clearly a lot of people who are sort of Republican leaners who, in the end, went to Trump surprisingly in 2016, voted against Gillespie in 2017 in what seems like an anti-Trump kind of vote. So it suggests that there's at least a chunk of voters who were lifelong Republicans who considered pulling the lever for Hillary and didn't, who have buyer's remorse um, and are willing to vote against even a Republican like Gillespie who seems like he fits their politics a little better. Um, that, but it doesn't necessarily tell you, what it doesn't necessarily tell you is, is the Democratic wave big enough to actually turn the House over in a year's time? And my colleague at the Times, Nate Cohn, um, did a write-up that basically said they're just, because of the nature of the state of Virginia and the distribution of votes and its demographics and so on, we aren't, this tells us that indeed Republicans, the re remaining Republican House members in blue states are, you know, in real trouble. Um, but it doesn't tell you whether there'll be an extra 10 or 15 s seats flipping. And for that to happen, the Democrats would need either higher minority turnout than they got, um, that seems to remain an issue for them, or st stronger inroads among whites without a college degree, which they didn't really... Yeah, they did, what, 72%? Yeah. 
think? Yeah, it, it was basically, I think Northam won like 1% more than, um, than Hillary did. Um, so it wasn't, Gillespie didn't add any votes over and above what Trump got, but the white working class in Virginia was still firmly in the Republican column. So that's, you know, so in that sense, it tells us more about what an energized suburban anti-Trump resistance can do. It tells us more about these suburban Republicans who might cast anti-Trump votes, and it, but it doesn't answer the million dollar question, which is will Nancy Pelosi be Speaker of the House in, maybe that's only the $500,000 right. question, and the million dollar question is something to do with Russia or something. And, yeah, I mean, there's the always the danger, right, that when you're, when you're looking at these things, because um, we're under pressure to have opinions, whether we have any very good opinions or not. Sometimes, uh, yeah. And th there's always the time, but there's a general temptation to overread history, right? And I remember in 2008, um, enormous numbers of people saying on the night Obama was elected, it's 1932, it's 1932. And I remember tweeting back at one of them who's a friend of ours. Meaning, you, you just to clarify yeah. for meaning, the younger meaning members. Meaning for those of you who are, who are not as old as I am right. and don't meaning remember FDR Franklin and Delano Hitler. Roosevelt. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a big night for me. Uh, yeah, that was, the, 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 that was when FDR was elected. And it was a sense that there was this radical transformation coming in politics. And if you look at the dominance of the Democrats, it's just astounding, right? It's, it's just the length of time that they managed to hold the House... Uh, the length of time that they were just had this incredible string of wins in presidential and national politics, but also at the local level. And I remember tweeting back at one of them who was a friend of ours, Spencer Ackerman. It's 1929, <laughs> right? Is that in fact, yes, the financial crisis has just happened, but FDR had three years. And the financial crisis, without you know, saying that FDR did nothing to help the Great Depression, I think there's a mixed record there, but certainly some of the things he did very obviously helped. Um, he, nonetheless, things were so bad at the bottom that it was hard for it to get substantially worse, right? At some point, even if nothing had been done, it would have bottomed out. It was just not going to, we were not going to continue down until G, GDP was zero. Um, Obama was coming in right after it had happened. And that what that meant was you no, know, I see why you think this is a historical parallel. And unfortunately, that disease had infected, for example, Chuck Schumer, who thought it's New Deal too. We've got it all, and and I think they made some major political missteps. And I think similarly, a lot of people I I've talked to are comparing what's going to happen in 2018 to what's going to happen, uh, what did happen in 2010 to Obama. The thing about what had happened to Obama was that in 2008, in part because of the financial crisis, in part because of Iraq, in part because of Katrina, Democrats were holding all of these seats they just shouldn't have, right? If you looked at the demographics of these districts, there was just no reason that there was a Democrat there, except that the Republicans had screwed up so badly. And while I, in fact, don't think that Bush had much to do with the financial crisis, I certainly think Iraq had disaffected a large number of voters who just didn't show up. And so, you know, the first aphorism I ever coined in politics, because like stealing, this is something you have to do if you want to be a columnist, is be constantly coining aphorisms and hope that one of them one, gets you up You just to need the, one of them to yeah, stick. The Kinsley and gaffe, then, for right, example, yeah. when, when a politician accidentally tells the truth. Uh, but this one actually had surprising legs. I was a blogger when I wrote this. I think it was 2002. And it was the devotees of the party in power are smug and arrogant. The devotees of the party out of power are insane. Um, I've never had cause to revisit this basic observation, which was that, you know, people, it was not good enough that George Bush was like a bad president. He needed to be Hitler. And it was not good enough that you really didn't like Bill Clinton's welfare policies. He had to be like shooting people in their cars and sneaking out of the White House to like rob orphans, right? And, um, Running drugs out of running Arkansas drugs. Or, was yeah, actually I can't the, remember all of the conspiracy the, theories at this point. I'm now well, I'm now freelancing. I do not want to start any new Clinton conspiracy <laughs> theories. But um, and and so there's always that effect on midterms, right? But but nonetheless, like if you look at how much Democrats had, they had 60 votes in the Senate. They had all these. It was Republicans actually just had a lot more space to get those insane people out to the polls and knock a lot more people off. So, I mean, I, like, what do you think about the House? What do you, what do you, what do you think of, it's kind of crazy. I, I mean, the, the way to, I mean, 
well, here we have, a, I mean, we have the, the fact, the central factor is how popular is Donald Trump, right? And the way Trump's popularity works is that if he doesn't do or say anything for a period of time, his approval rating floats upward towards a sort of basic Republican coalition norm, which About is to 45%, say, for, right? yeah, yeah, I mean, 43, for, I mean, he could only get, he got 46% to vote for him, but the percentage you approve of him, <laughs> it's harder, it's harder to get about so 42 a or 43. wonderful commentary on right? modern American politics. And it? then, and then he tweets or something happens in the world and, you know, and, and the fact that he is president is brought to people's attention once again, <laughs> and then his approval rating dips down, but it doesn't usually get much below 38, 37%. Um, it's weird because it's sort of like an ex-president, right? You notice that all ex-presidents get more beloved after they leave office. Right, like he, gets more, now, he gets more tolerable right, when you forget it, he's in office. We yes. actually yes. have ex-president syndrome only while the president is still there, as long as people can right. kind of forget. Well, there's get, a, well and, when, and when, you know, when Roy Moore is president, there will be many liberal essays <laughs> about, oh, for the days of moderate Republicans like Donald Trump. Um, <clears throat> Everybody's laughing, but they won't be laughing soon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that it, there's, I mean, this is sort of a pundit cop-out, but there's a sense in which a lot depends on just where in the cycle of Trump's approval ratings the at literal election day of 2018 happens to fall. Um, and, and this is what, Donald Trump won the White House because election day 2016 was held at a particular moment in his cycle where he was capable of hitting 46% of the vote. Had it been held you know, a week later, I suspect that he would have gotten 44% and lost. Had it been held you know, when the Access Hollywood tape came out, he would have gotten 41% and so on. So it's, I, think a similar, I think a similar reality will apply. You get, you know, if Trump's at 36 or 37%, the, the Republicans will probably lose the House. And if he's floated up to 43%, they will keep it. And if he's at 40%, then it's a, then it's a coin toss. Um, but, you know, I mean, obviously a million other factors play in and, you know, ground game enthusiasm, candidate selection. But the Democrats are doing a good job of candidate recruitment overall. They're going to have a lot of enthusiasm among their core voters. And that's usually what you need for a midterm wave. And so, yeah, the question is just, does, does Trump's, Unpop is Trump's unpopularity low enough to sort of sink Republican turnout just enough and inspire Democratic turnout just enough to put them over the top? And I, I literally like, you know, you could, you could play that out with this year and go through calendar day after calendar day and say, okay, on this day, the Democrats take the House. On this day, Republicans <laughs> hold it by, you know, by two seats or something. Um, so I, I don't I mean something big could happen that could change that dynamic, but any time in the last six months, I think that would have been true. And so projecting forward, it's easy to imagine it being true then too. So the Democrats need, you know, if they have another, an Access Hollywood type tape, this time they literally need to leak it six hours before the polls <laughs> open because they need to assume this sort of right. wave function in Trump's approval rating and that it shapes who votes Sort of the them. Heisenberg uncertainty principle well, of that's, Trump. Yeah. Um, I actually tried to slip a, a, a sentence into my year-end appraisal of, of Trump that I did for Business Week in which I described America as currently listening, uh, living in a permanent state of quantum dread, but the editor thought that was a little too little pretentious. A little too, too and, pretentious. Uh, so I'm actually going to... But it has it was a year... It's only been nine months. It's you, our year-end, so we, we do business... I, we, right. Uh, business the, Week does a year-end... Oh, on the magazine uh, cycle. On the yeah. magazine side. Yeah. So this will allow me to take a detour, um, which is another thing that columnists love. Uh, you're getting all of the professional columnist insight here right now. Because uh, my class is, is, is here. You're not a professional I'm... columnist here, Megan. You're a professor. <laughs> well, I have very little... Prof having taught now six classes, I feel... Actually, you, have, you, have, you have infinite yes. experience. Uh, yeah, no, well, I mean, for a columnist, right? right. Three is a trend. Yeah. So, uh, so we have to kind of assess Republicans. And I want to move on to conservatism in a little while, but... Uh, Republicans, who are at least somewhat loosely related, I think still to conservatism, Ross may dispute that, um, you know, they, they exist in, in beautiful yin and yang uh, with the Democratic Party. And in, at the end of 2016, after the election, 
this had been something that people were saying for years, is like the Democrats are in much worse shape than it looks like, and that Obama had been masking in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the, the party had been devastated in the down ticket races and was losing control of state legislatures, losing control. Um, that looks like the reports of the Democratic Party's death may have been greatly exaggerated. Um, so where do you think that they are? I mean, I've read, I am now at the point where in the past... 10, 15 years, I have literally read the description, a rump regional party confined to X, right, applied to both, both parties, parties at least three times a piece in Within different years. two years of each other. Yes, exactly, yeah. right? Like the Democrats were going to be, a, the Republicans are going to be a rump party confined to the South, and then in, all of a sudden it looks like the Democrats are a rump party confined to the Northeast and confined to the coasts. Right. What do you think? Are they, it, it, was that always exaggerated? How, how good a shape are the Democrats in? Well, I mean, they're in bad shape, right? I mean, they have no power, so that's, that's, <laughs> well, not, that's not good. Temporary, my Temporarily, point. right? Temporary. I mean, no, I mean, it's not, it's not good. Um, I would expect that just as, you know, I mean, both parties are in bad shape, right? That's sort of, the, you have a Republican Party that's running the country that, you know, is sort of imprisoned by... Donald Trump's distinctive qualities and also, you know, has a majority by default because the country or some percentage of the country doesn't, you know, is united on not wanting the Democrats in charge without being united on any kind of substantive agenda. So you have a sort of agenda-less majority party running the country, which cuts against everything that journalists are supposed to believe. Like, we believe in these narratives where you, your party loses election, goes into wilderness, emerges with new agenda, rides new agenda to victory, implements New Deal, Great Society, Reagan Revolution, contract with America, etc. And the Republicans have proven that that's completely wrong, and you don't need to develop a new agenda to retake power. Um, you just need to have an extremely closely divided country, um, some luck, and an opposition party that the rest of the country doesn't like. So the problem for the Democrats is that, you know, the country moved, that they have moved left faster than the country in certain ways. Not on every issue, um, but if you look at, if you go back to the mid-2000s or the early 2000s, um, you have this famous book called The Emerging Democratic Majority, right, which argues that for various, because of deep demographic trends, the Democrats are destined to have a majority sort of into the distant future because all Democratic constituencies are growing, minorities, single people, um, uh, you know, and, and so on, and all Republican Christ constituencies, meaning, you know, white Christian married people in the heartland are shrinking, and therefore, you know, at some point the lines cross and keep crossing and the Democrats win. And that theory has been beaten up and argued over and so on ever since, you know, the Democrats didn't claim a permanent majority. Um, but it's been emerging for about 15 years at this but, point. But it's the like fundamental, Godot. Right, it's, but the <laughs> fundamental truth there is that had the Democrats maintained their exact issue orientation that they had when that book was written and carried it forward into the present, they would have a majority. But I, you can't do that, right? But you right? can't do that because as the country moves, the composition of your party changes, the activists in your party become, for totally understandable reasons, more ambitious. And so as the country moved left in part, in part for ideological and in part for demographic reasons, the Democrats moved left too. And so Democratic success or failure over this period has sort of depended on whether they can sort of pull themselves back so they're slightly behind the country's leftward drift or when it feels like they're slightly ahead of it. And I think part of what happened in the late Obama years was that there was this sense that sort of certain kinds of cultural change had happened so fast that there was a large constituency for not so much even backlash as just let's not have the Democrats in charge for a little while. And that, you know, and th that constituency was sort of enough to keep the Democrats out of power, even though or because the Democrats had won this sort of remarkable string of cultural victories um, and had gained a kind of cultural power more broadly that I think liberals sometimes tend to underestimate how distinctive it is. Like, we, you know, you and I grew up in a world where it was understood that the media was liberal and that Hollywood had a liberal bias and so on. And, you know, this was sort of part of the architecture of how conservatives thought about cultural institutions. 
Um, but, and, that, and that higher education was also liberal, right? So it was assumed among conservatives that the major institutions of American culture were pretty liberal. But they weren't all liberal. Like late night television, for instance, was not considered a zone of strong political engagement. Um, the universities were liberal, but if you looked at like faculty balances in the late 1980s, you know, it was like 75-25 in a lot of major universities, Republican versus Democrat. Um, and, you know, and you could sort of go down a list and say all of these cultural arenas were either they were liberal, but they were not that liberal, or they were, not, they were somewhat apolitical. And as the country has moved to the left on a lot of cultural issues, and to some extent on economic issues too, those institutions have in turn moved even further left. They've become more politicized. Um, you know, this, the spread of sort of daily show alumni across late night TV is a kind of useful sort of microcosm of this larger phenomenon. And as that has happened, conservatives have, and not just conservatives, but sort of somewhat apolitical people have felt, I think, more, more alienated from their cultural institutions than did conservatives circa 1985 or 1993 or something. And I think that creates a problem for the Democrats, that where you, you have a situation where, they're, again, their ideology is sort of winning these cultural battles, but it's leading to a situation where people are using political votes as a way to try and sort of resist or slow that trend a little bit. Um, but with all that being said, you know, this, that resistance ultimately put Donald Trump in the Oval Office. And Donald, with Donald Trump in the Oval Office, the Democrats should be able to win a lot of elections because Trump, you know, lots and lots of people voted, I mean, explicitly voted for Trump just because they didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton or they didn't want to vote for liberalism. And now he's not a sort of locus of protest and resistance. I mean, there's a reason that Fox News likes to pretend that Hillary Clinton is somehow president of the United States, because they know that the appeal of Trump is rooted in anxiety about Hillary in particular, but sort of liberal power in general. And, you know, liberal power in the political arena is non-existent at the moment, and so you aren't going to be able to mobilize voters around that kind of that kind of anxiety as long as Trump's in the White House. So yeah, there's a sort of weird phenomenon where both parties would like to have lost because it's much more fun to like gear up your voters when when you're out of power and can therefore uh, run against whatever was. Um, oh, well, and certainly the hosts of cable television shows yes. would have liked their party um, to have so lost. So here's a question that I found myself asking for the first time in. I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. And by way of background, I should say, I'm basically a cultural relativist in a lot of ways. I take sort of the anthropological view that you can't really talk about cultures having better and worse values because there's not even a place where you could have that conversation, right? Like, you can only start off with the values you have. You cannot converse meaningfully across cultures about bedrock values. Um, I mean, you, can't converse meaningfully is not the right way to put it. You can't have an argument that it is possible to win, right? You cannot say, if you start with different assumptions, you can, like, you're going to end with different assumptions. You can't actually just convince someone if their premises are completely different and they don't accept your basic premises. I think that's something that, cult that liberalism in the classical Western liberalism, not in the left-wing political sense, um, sort of forgot. But I've, I've long thought this about arguments about all sorts of cultural issues with the Middle East and, and other places, but I'm starting to ask it about my own country, is that I'm starting to wonder if it is even possible at this point to have arguments that it is possible to win between liberals and conservatives, and I find this a very worrying question. But the premises seem to me to be so increasingly different that I don't even know if you can get to a point where you could have an argument. <laughs> you can shout at each other, you can denigrate each other, you can you know, hurl imprecations at each other, but can we discuss and can we actually reach a conclusion coming together across this alienated Trump voter and commanding heights cultural divide? Well, first, I don't think liberals f forgot that. In fact, I think, I think in certain ways they, they believed it 
Again, I mean so, in, the, in the liberal enlightenment sense, you not mean, in the sense oh, you, that you like that, yeah, you mean liberals. libertarian, effectively in our discourse, libertarian. But, well, I mean, like that. all of America has, in some sense, had certain classical liberal commitments right. to freedom of, of speech and assembly and right. religion, and this idea of a public square in which we come for debate, and ultimately the best idea wins. And sometimes we just agree to disagree, and we're just going to walk away from the debate. But always there is a sense that we could have a discussion. Maybe at some point we'll run into something and say, you know what, we're just not going to be able to solve this one. But that this, there is a constant process by which we right. change our national idea set for the better. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think that, yeah, I, I mean, I think both liberalism and conservatism in different ways have sort of, as movement ideologies, again, not as right. sort of the framework of our society, have, have been operating on the assumption that your anthropological relativism is correct or that it's wrong up to a point and then it becomes right. Like I think you yes. see this with, with um, uh, on for instance, same-sex marriage. I think same-sex marriage became a model that a lot of people on the left thought could be applied more generally where you have an argument for a while and you, you, know, you have that argument to the point where you have won sufficiently that you end the argument and declare you know, the other position sort of out of bounds. And I think there's a sense on the left that they did that successfully with race and the civil rights movement. They did that successfully with same-sex marriage and that this could be sort of applied right. to other, you know, that you could say, all right, now if you are opposed to, you know, increasing the immigration rate, you are, you know, we're, we're excluding that from the debate because it is bigoted and racist and rooted in atavistic sensibilities and so on. Um, and on, on the one hand, as a conservative and someone whose own ideas often fall outside that circle, I obviously want to say, well, that's wrong, you know, and it's illiberal and you're, you know, not living up to our civilization's premises and, you know, let me back into the debate, right? I want to say that. Um, but there, there is also a sense in which you know, I recognize that we live in a society that is culturally and below cult the level of culture, metaphysically diverse in a way that, does, that, as you say, makes it very hard to sort of sustain argument between, especially between groups at different poles, right? Yeah, I mean, you, there is still a center in America. You can still have arguments in the middle, but among, between sort of the core activist groups and the two parties, it is very hard to have an argument. It is very hard to have an argument between immigration restrictionists and pro-immigration activists right now. Um, it's very hard, you know, it's very hard to have an argument around a lot of issues related to human sexuality. It's very hard to have an argument around issues related to race. So the issues where we can still have arguments are arguments about the tax code and stuff. Um, that's and, coming next. And that's, well, that's maybe, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, but, but so, I mean, one way, so in, in my sort of, this is a pessimistic way of thinking about it, but it also might be a politically useful way of thinking about it. One way to think about our politics is that we, in certain ways, we have more in common with a kind of multi-ethnic Central European empire circa like 1787 than we do with a kind of sort of like small scale New England town meeting civic Republican tradition. And in a lot of ways, when you think about the job of the presidency, and you could call this how I stop worrying and learn to love the imperial presidency, but in certain ways, the job of the president is to be a kind of benevolent Habsburg emperor who is capable of, despite emerging out of one faction or the other in our politics, of sort of standing a little bit above some of these debates and trying to make sure basically that the groups that are losing politically don't feel like the stakes are existential for them. That they feel like, all right, I'm losing these debates, I'm losing these battles, but I'm not actually gonna get crushed. And this is something where, this is why, for one thing, this is part of why Trump is a terrible president, because Trump is a bad emperor in the sense that he is incapable of reassuring anyone outside his core coalition that he's not out to get them, basically. Like, if Trump were a good president, he would have spent an inordinate amount of time in his first six months in minority communities, sort of being like, look, 
I, you, you didn't agree with me, I didn't agree with you, I'm still, I'm not gonna be in favor of affirmative action, I'm still building the wall, but I'm here to tell you that I'm your president. And that's a hard thing to do, and it doesn't necessarily work, but he's particularly bad at it. And Well, in part and, because his, part of his appeal, right, is, is that, no, those people are the, I am an existential threat exactly. to those people, yes. right? Yes. Is that this is... Right, that I'm answering, you know, you feel like liberalism is about to crush you, vote for me, I will crush liberalism. Yes. But I remember trying to explain to my liberal friends um, why religious conservatives viewed some of the stuff the Obama administration had done as an existential threat. Right. Not like we don't like this, not we disagree with this, but like this could actually make it impossible for me to live my life in my religious community the way I have. Um, and it was like it just flew over people's heads. Like we're now talking about something so completely different when we thought about what free exercise was and what religion was and what they, and that's the thing that I look at when I look at my conservative readers. You know, we talk about identity politics, I'm using this incredibly broadly and to talk about taxes. So I've been writing about Trump's tax code, which for an econ policy uh, wonk is kind of the gift that keeps on giving. There are so many things you can write about it. Um, and, and here is my kind of take on the tax code, which actually does some stuff that should be done. Um, it, you know, like the, the mortgage interest tax deduction should be gotten rid of, not merely capped at $500,000, but $500,000 cap is a good start. Um, and a number of other things like that, that there, that in fact, you know, I think there's a lot of things that it tries to do that are totally legitimate things to try to do, but that the way it is done, that it's so completely pointed at one group of affluent professionals in, um, blue states who see their taxes go up quite a lot and who may or may not include people on this stage, um, and then there's tax cuts for everyone else, including Donald Trump, who I feel like, you know, and, and I, was, I was saying uh, to a Democratic policy wonk who was on the radio with last week, I was saying, like, look, if this had been done a different way, if those tax cuts had all gone to people who made, you know, half what I do, or if it had gone, I don't know, crazy thought to deficit reduction and putting our entitlements on a sound footing. <laughs> I've given up on that. Uh, I've, I've also given up on that. But uh, well, I hope, I dream, but I do not believe. Um, but I wouldn't, I would be like, yeah, go. Um, but the way it's done where it's just kind of obvious that like we hate you seems to be the major message of this tax code, I think that is a bad tax plan. And my Republican readers didn't even really come back and argue. They and, and I'm increasingly getting this from a lot of people is just, this is just your class interest. That you are one of these cosmopolitan elites, you live in Washington, you go to Georgetown cocktail parties. I have, by the way, as far as I know, never been to a Georgetown cocktail just, party. Just own it, Megan. Uh, just tell them you go to all the Georgetown <laughs> cocktail parties. It's better that way. Um, That's the David Frum approach. It's He's weird, always like, right? I'm hosting one at my house tonight. <laughs> you know? He doesn't actually live in Georgetown. Well, know, he's close, it's close like, I think. Um, I, but, that's, you know, you can argue with this is good policy or this is bad policy. Right. You can argue with this is, you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. If this is what it takes to do these things, well, let's do them and then we'll worry about the rest later. Those are all valid arguments. You can't argue with I am this person, you are that person, right? Like, Megan McArdle, you are Irish American, you know, 44, live in Washington, D.C., affluent professional, went to an Ivy League school and have an MBA. Yeah. Okay, well, we've gotten that out of the way. I mean, what am I supposed to say? No. <laughs> um, and similarly, that's the thing that I worry about, is that identity in a very broadly construed sense, not in the kind of narrow way in which uh, Republicans often criticize it, identity politics, or Democrats for that matter, when they just say Republicanism is all white identity politics, I think it's more complicated than that. But the way in which identity, argument from identity, Right. In these really broad senses has, inflict, has infected Republicans. Um, what does that mean? Since the title of this well, is Conservatism see, but then, in the Age but of then Trump. Like, you know, I mean, the affluent professionals, though, are really bad. Right? But then, no, this is and, the thing. And, this I mean, is this the is, weird this thing. Is, this like, is here. You and I You're going to pull both. me into, uh, into my own like, self-hating upper middle class identity, anti-identity identity But identity you politics, and I are but, both self-hating members right. of, of the swamp elite, right? right? So like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak up more for the self-hatred. So I think, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I think you're right that the, 
The problem with the Republican tax bill is that it seems to, it, it amounts to sort of a war within the elites. It's like, we're going to stick it to the people making $400,000 on behalf of rich, wealthy heirs inheriting $5 million and, you know, corporate CEOs and right. so on. And meanwhile, everybody else gets, you know, gets very little. Basically. But you sure American flags but, for everyone else. Right. But, but, that's, but that's, since we're talking about conservatism, I mean, that's the essential, uh, set aside like these sort of big picture questions about the state of the body politic. On substance, the problem with the Republican Party is that since George W. Bush, it hasn't figured out a way to offer a policy agenda that seems to offer substantive benefits to anyone making less than $125,000 a year. And so this, this tax bill is an improvement on that problem in the sense that like, it actually does, you know, it does ask some people make it, you know, some people who are by the standards of America as a whole very well off, it does impose some necessary pain on them in the form of capping and cutting counterproductive tax deductions and so on. But it still isn't doing very much for the country as a whole for you know the ordinary citizen it's doing that on behalf of again people who pay the estate tax which is nobody and um, and corporations but those nobodies which give a lot of money they do give to a lot of money party and candidates. corporations where you have a sort of you know there's this Kevin Hassett has this you know there's the theory that more of the corporate tax go gets through to wages and so on maybe that's true but but still but to me that's that problem is, th that is a case where I think it's legit. I think it's, this is like the vulgar Marxist in me probably, but I think it's more legit to sort of target people on the basis of economic privileges they enjoy than it is to target people on the basis of either their religious beliefs or their racial background and so on. Oh, and sure. so I'm more comfortable with, I, I, I would like the Republican Party to engage in a little class war against people like you and me, because people like you and me wield disproportionate power in the American political system and have a lot of unearned privileges that have nothing to do with the free market or anything like that. They just have to do with our political power. And I would be fine with the Republican Party stripping away those privileges if, while doing it, it was spending more money on the child tax credit and less money on, you know, on, like, you could just do, I mean, they could just take the corporate rate down seven percentage points instead yeah. of 15 percentage points, spend the extra money on the child tax credit, and ditch the estate tax and use that to ease the pain on people like us a little bit, and you'd have a good bill. But, it's but, but, that's, but that's sort of, yeah, that's getting into the details of policy as opposed to the, yeah, the sort of larger questions, I guess. Well, I guess I, I was... When Trump was um, running, I would have these conversations with readers, and they would be like, but you people hate him. And I would be like, that is true. And I share your critique of my class. I mean, you know, like I have, since way back, been critiquing the, uh, the kind of elite class in the... In the um, terrible, and yet, terrible people like, like us. A lot of the logic that I got from readers, and I remember actually responding with exactly this to one reader, because I am like one of the, I'm the only journalists on the internet who goes into her comments regularly. And I finally said to someone, here is what I'm hearing from you. This woman I am dating, I'm getting engaged. She has a substance abuse problem. She spends more money than she has and has buried us in debt. She beats my kids. She tried to burn the house down, but my ex-wife hates her. <laughs> And I was like, that is not a good reason to get married, <laughs> right? Um, yes, like all of these things are true. All of these criticisms that you have of this class is true. That is not a reason to endorse this. And that is like, is that the fundamental thing that we seem to be down to? And again, by sort the of, but your, some of it so is your that... argument was a, these people have too much. They can afford, they have too much power and they can afford to let go of some of their power and money. Right. That is an argument from, that's a class warfare argument that's a perfectly fair argument to have. The class war argument that worries me is like, these, I, hate these, I hate these people. And, you know, you and see, we have to drink sweet liberal tears yes. while we watch Trump romp to and, electoral and, and there's victory. a sort yes. of like, you know, 
they, they did a poll in Russia, I remember at one point, and they asked Russians whether they would rather have, you know, X amount of wealth or would they would rather have Y amount of wealth, uh, but that was less than X, right. but, but it was, but it, their neighbor would have even less. And then they asked a third question where like, would you actually just like destroy something your neighbor had <laughs> at, at an expense to yourself in order to make yourself better off? And like a shocking number of people were like, yes, I would pay a great deal of money to just destroy what my neighbor has, even though that will make me poorer. And there are situations in which that is in fact justified uh, World War II, for example. Um, but in general, right, that's a bad way to feel and it is a symptom of an incredibly unhealthy society where I feel like more and more people feel that way is that I literally will destroy what I have if it makes them even unhappier than me. Um, and that yes, is, I've seen right, an enormous yes, amount in, of that in, in the Republican defense, Party. I mean, so it's a big country, right? And that's also important to remember in these con kind of conversations that every generalization you make about a candidate who received Fair tens enough. of millions of votes is going to be true. There were lots of people who voted, first, there were lots of people who voted for Trump for defensive reasons. Um, they yes. voted for Trump because they, they wanted, they basically wanted the status quo on the Supreme Court. They didn't want the balance of the Supreme Court to change and they were worried about, you know, the future of their own religious institutions. They were worried about various other things related to jurisprudence and so on. Now, that's, may not be a re I mean, I, you know, we were both against Trump, so we're having a sort of never Trump, you know, We confab at Bloomberg you do here, not but, officially but, endorse. I was but, certainly highly critical right. of Trump. Yeah, I, I don't think you voted for Trump, but, um, <laughs> but. We at Bloomberg View do not officially endorse. No, well, neither did we, neither. <laughs> yeah, I didn't officially endorse either, but, um, and that, yeah. Um, but whether or not it's a, that's, whether or not that argument makes sense, it's still the case that that's different from casting a vote that's like nihilistic, a nihilistic fist shake at liberalism. And then similarly, like, you know, and this is again where my class warfare sympathies come in, Donald Trump won a lot of votes by flying around the country and going to places that had been hard hit by global capitalism and telling them that he was gonna bring their jobs back. And yes, like voting for a candidate who promises that is a little bit like you know, letting Lyle Landley put a monorail between Springfield and Shelbyville or whatever in The Simpsons. Like, yes, you're falling a little bit for a con man, but at the same, by the same token, if all the other politicians have spent the last 15 years telling you that job retraining is going to fix right. your life after the factory went away, why wouldn't you roll the dice on a guy right. who might be a con man? Like, and I, that I deplorable's just think, remark hurt. Hillary a great deal because it resonated in exactly those places. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think I think that there are a lot of there are, there are a lot of different reasons that one might cast a vote for Donald Trump, and only some of them have to do with a sort of pure fist shake at you know the the lib, at the liberals, and second that that also people are complicated, right? And like. Some, you know, some days I, I you know, I, I, I mean, what I find when I watch politics is whoever I'm, whatever I think about a given election, in the moment that the election is happening, if there are a bunch of liberal talking heads on TV and something bad is happening to the Democratic Party, I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm not proud of that feeling. It's not, you know, it's not the best part of me, but I enjoy it. I have and a large I enjoy it for of, reasons that, yeah, anyway. I have a large number of Never Trump conservative friends who spent nine months wailing. I mean, like, I, the, de the emotional devastation uh, after the primaries. And then the night of the election, we're simultaneously, I am going to be like, oh, my God, this is a catastrophe. I can't believe this is happening. And then we're like, have you seen MSNBC? It's awesome. Right. <laughs> no, and this, this is not the best part of ourselves. No, it is But the fact not. that it is present, you know, in people who were against Trump, suggests that, right. you know, again, in people who had other better reasons for being for Trump, you shouldn't assume that that's... Fair enough. Um, that's, yeah, anyway. Um, so so to, to go to our, our final question, because we're going to open this up for Q&A soon, like, conservative, what's the future? We, I mean, we are, we are kind of... In, in 2016, we had, like, a Republican civil war. Mm-hmm. And I feel like yeah. it, it was pretty close to a, a Republican. I, I was on the convention floor. I don't remember if you were there when 
you know, the the Utah and Colorado are right. trying to lead a revolt. The, Mor the Mormon rebellion of <laughs> yes, 2016. Uh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. I was, I was in a throng around Senator Mike Lee uh, with, and you know, everyone is rushing out there and um, it didn't go anywhere, but it was a kind of the most political moment I've ever been in. But after the election, it kind of seemed like it died away and everyone was just kind of stumbling around staring at each other going, what happened? Right. And I feel like in a lot of ways, the conservatives I know are still in that spot um, of just not really, you know, on any side, right? The, the Trump people for a little while maybe thought that this was their, their big revolution. By now, they seem confused. Yeah. Um, the, the conservative movement that I thought was the conservative movement and then turned out to be more complicated than that, um, is just kind of despairing and just shaking their head a lot. Mm -hmm. Where are we? Am I wrong about this? Is there something more going on that I'm missing? No, I mean, the, the, so basically Donald, Donald Trump represented a real ideological debate over the future of the Republican Party that he won. But then he turned out to have no interest in that ideology. Turned out? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I thought he didn't, but there were people who thought that he did Fair have enough. an interest in a kind of yes. comprehensive populist nationalist alternative. To, it was revealed in a broader way. It was way revealed in a broad had. way that he yes. did not have a plan for this, and he also didn't have the personnel for it, right? There were no Trumpists to staff the White House. There were no veterans of previous Republican White Houses who were ready to go in and renegotiate NAFTA and design a huge infrastructure bill and so on. There were, and had Trump been really shrewd and smart, he could have gone into the, the Wonka sphere that you and I know so well and found some people who would have been simpatico and built a White House team, but he wasn't capable of doing that. Well, to do that, he would have had to stop with the tweeting and the over-the-top statements because part of the problem was that by the time he won the election, much to the surprise of everyone. Even if he hadn't done that, he still, it, he st there were still people who would have worked for him. And he wouldn't have gotten the best sort of populist nationalist brain trust, but he could have gotten something better than Steve Bannon alone making phone calls <laughs> and trying to take over the government. I mean, and, you know, and, and Miller too. But, like, but you know, I mean, it, it was basically just Bannon. I mean, he could have gone, he could have gotten foreign policy people from the sort of, um, you know, American conservative, you know, he could have, he could have brought on Andrew Bacevich as a foreign policy advisor. He could have, he could have gone and, you know, he could have gotten like Henry Olson to tell him what, to, I mean, these are semi-obscure names maybe, but like, right. but they, he, he could have gotten some smart people who would have at least tried to work, work with him on making his ideology into something fleshed out. He didn't even try to do that. So... Having done that, all the people who might support that ideology, like the people who founded American Affairs, you know, this right. sort of journal of Trumpist thought, they're like trying to build the intellectual architecture after the fact with, you know, an, in, an incompetent in the White House who's theoretically tied to their ideology. So they don't know what exactly to do. And meanwhile, the rest of the party is like, all right, we lost, we lost, but let's just pretend we didn't. <laughs> and just keep passing the kind of legislation we wanted to pass, and maybe it'll all work out. And there's no figure in the party who has a sort of coherent vision of how you would integrate Trumpian populism and sort of the existing Reaganite infrastructure into whatever the next thing is that conservatism should be. And, uh, you know, I mean, you have some very admirable Republicans who are, have opposed Trump, but I don't think any of them have a clear vision of what the party should be. Like, I really like Ben Sass, but what does Ben Sass... Everyone likes Ben Sass. What does Ben Sass think the Republican Party should be? Jeff Flake thinks the Republican Party should be this sort of fantasy of Goldwaterite libertarianism that it hasn't been and, and never will be. Um, Evan McMullen thinks the, the party should be the Democrats. And, no, that's, that's unkind. Um, but you know the sort of the sort of an so the, the the sort of forthrightly anti-Trump voices don't have a vision. The people running the party, the Ryan's and McConnells, are just like we're just going to try and pass the sort of bad to mediocre legislation we had already and see what happens. And it turns out that's incredibly unpopular. 
so they can't get very far with that. And then you have some people who are interesting in terms of what they're trying to do, but again, don't like, you know, a Tom Cotton, for instance, who is like, all right, I'm going to be sort of, I'm going to try and lead the party after Trump. Like, that's clearly the Tom Cotton ambition. Um, but there isn't, he doesn't have a fully fleshed out vision for what that would mean. Why is it? So I remember, I don't know if you remember this, that we were on a panel together done by the America's Future Foundation, I believe in 2007 or 2008. And at that panel, I said, it's time for the Republicans to ditch taxes. This is just, they've run that issue as far as they can. Mm -hmm. So 10 years later, what is the one thing Republicans might do is taxes. Why can't they get beyond it? Why can't, why can't conservatives get be? I mean, I feel like conservatives are I mean, doing some interesting things, but... There, part of it is a failure of political imagination and leadership. Um, part of it is, you know, the sort of the dead hand of ideological assumptions. Part of it is there isn't a donor base for a more sort of, you know, I mean, I mean ultimately a more popular conservative agenda would be more centrist on economics. It would be libertarian on certain things, um, but it would not be sort of supply-side economics as the party has inherited it. And with, with the party's donor base really likes supply-side economics. And that does seem to drive not all, but a lot of a lot of sort of the failure of imagination among Republican politicians. It's that, you know, they, and the fact that they keep sort of cycling back into power despite not having any ideas. I mean, that's, in some ways, that's the deepest issue here, right? Which is that the Republicans lost hugely in 2008. Democrats, as you say, were talking about how it's 1932 all over again. And two years later, the Republicans were right back. And then today, the Republicans control the government. Why would they try anything new? You try things that are new when you've been thumped in election after election. Like Bill Clinton really did represent a change for Democrats. That came after three consecutive crushing presidential defeats. And the Republicans had two with Obama and um, maybe if they'd had a third, you know, you started, you know, you started to get figures like Rubio and Jeb Bush sort of moving a little bit on domestic policy. But that was like the beginnings and then Trump came along and was like, oh, actually, we can just tear it all up, right? I mean, Trump proved that the party in certain ways had moved too slowly to change its agenda, but then Trump couldn't implement a new agenda, so the party itself just went back to the old agenda. Anyway, it's very depressing. Like if the, I, mean, I mean, this is the, the, the fundamental reality is that the Republican Party controls the government of the United States, has no agenda, is run by Donald Trump, and doesn't have plausible future leaders who have a clear agenda or sort of path to, to leadership. And, you know, hopefully things will get better, but since we're here offering takes on the state of conservatism, that's, that's the fundamental reality. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a great situation, all things considered. And, you know, I hold out hope for the, you know, Cotton Ivanka ticket of 2024 or something, or the Ivanka Rubio ticket. Well, and when the rock runs, I think that well, right. I'm no, looking for the rock and the Democratic ultimately, side. No, yeah. Ultimately, the lesson of the last election cycle, and I'm only half kidding about this, is that if you have a set of ideas and you care about the future of conservatism, or perhaps liberalism for that matter, you need to attach yourself to a well-known celebrity, gain their ear and their trust, and that is infinitely better than you know, writing white papers and columns and position papers and so on. And so really, the, yes, the people who get the rock's ear are the people who are going to shape the future of whichever party the rock decides and if to you know dominate. And if you know anything about his diet and workout regime, it is going to be whoever runs the cod industry in the United States because he eats like seven pounds of cod a day. Uh, uh, yeah, no, this is actually true. I did not true. know that. Uh, so we're going to open it up to, to Q&A. Um, we have microphones on each, we have a microphone up there for those who are in the, you know, these, these more elevated climbs and uh, for people down here with the regular people, there is a microphone back there. Please, uh, if you want to ask a question, go up to it, state your name because we are recording this and uh, this is for posterity. Um, and 
One by one. Okay, great. Uh, you, sir. Hi, I have a question. David Shanzer, I'm a faculty member here at the Sanford School. I wonder if you could uh, explain what conservatism would say about a very important question before the Supreme Court. Apparently, Justice Kennedy will decide this for America uh, about uh, judicial supervision over partisan gerrymandering. Uh, I would think one conservative principle would be that judges getting involved in anything having to do with politics is not very conservative. But I would wonder if conservatism sees a problem in a situation where 60% of the votes result in 40% of the seats. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think my general view is the conservative one that that's the kind of question that in our system would not normally be appropriately settled by the courts. And I'm also kind of skeptical of the kind of court ordered, what a court ordered system is likely to look at, um, likely to look like. So that's, that's sort of my boringly conventional conservative answer in a sense, that basically the way to deal with partisan gerrymandering the, is the sort of immediate way is for, uh, you know, Democrats to win more elections and sort of gerrymander in their own ways and have competitive gerrymandering as God intended. Um, but then at a, macro, <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a larger level, I also think that the, the sort of the structural problem of partisan polarization does make me more sympathetic to sort of wilder electoral schemes of, um, you know, sort of, and I, again, this is not an area of expertise of mine at all, but sort of effectively like rank ordered balloting and different, different kinds of things where the goal is basically to sort of change the, compo change the ideological composition I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to multiple ideas that would sort of change the ideological incentives for congressmen. And you could do that with different voting systems within the states. You could potentially do it with stronger political parties in certain ways. Um, the, um, where, you know, if you change some of the fundraising rules around what kind of levels of money the central parties are actually allowed to give to candidates. You could theoretically lighten the burden of fundraising on congressmen. I mean, this is part of, part of the issue with congressmen, it goes to the, the donor problem we were talking about, is that the, it's not just that they're in gerrymandered districts and so on, it's also that they are, they are you know, dependent on being sort of fundraisers of one. Each, each congressman, which is not how it works in more centralized um, and often parliamentary systems around the Western world. And so there might, there might potentially be advantages in having, you know, I mean, something like Donald Trump is a phenomenon of a weak party, not a strong party. So you have intense partisan polarization and weak parties. That, that's a combination that, that leads to gridlock. Um, so conceivably, you could deal with partisan polarization in part by strengthening the parties in certain ways so that even though they're polarized, they aren't as much prisoners of their, um, of sort of particular donors. But I don't know, I, I've not thought deeply about the legal questions in the Supreme Court case, so I can't give you a sort of deep answer on that. My instinctive conservative bias is that it's not, you know, that this is sort of, well, I'm, I'm torn. This is like a larger question that I wrestle with, as you could, sorry, as you can tell from the sort of, you know, <laughs> Habsburg analogies, right? Like, <laughs> on the one hand, you want to preserve the republic, right? On the other hand, you need a workable system of government. And the tendency has been over the last 20 years is the way our system keeps working is that Congress cedes more and more power and the Supreme Court and the presidency accumulate more and more power. And that's sort of, to my mind, deeply anti-Republican and deeply troubling. At the same time, you know, you do need the system to work. And at a certain point, nostalgia for the days when Congress was really good at legislating becomes just that, nostalgia. And this is where you get into the point of like, well, at what point is sort of the re do you cease sort of being nostalgic for the republic that was and start rooting for Caesar Augustus? And of course, this is the theory that, you know, brought many people to vote for Trump. And I'm not to that theory yet, but it is something that occasionally bobs around in the back of my mind. On that happy <laughs> note, Asa. <laughs> Sorry, Megan. Asa, I'm a junior. I'm taking uh, Professor McArdle's class on op-ed writing. Uh, so 
Mr. Dathit, I recently read one of your columns that said somebody should primary Trump uh, because he's a bad president and that's right. somebody's obligation. And one of the people that you suggested was Matt Bevin, who's the governor of Kentucky. And 538 recently wrote that Matt Bevin is an exemplar of Trumpism succeeding without Trump. And so when you suggested that he run for president, I was curious why. Is it because you think that Trumpism without Trump is good for the Republican Party? It's good for America? It's good, like, why, why, why should Matt Bevin run for president and why should he primary Donald Trump? Um, well, first, as the political landscape looks right now, Matt Bevin should not primary Trump. Um, if the political landscape changed to the point where Trump was, it was plausible to imagine someone defeating Trump in a primary, then someone like Bevin or the other example I gave with Scott Walker seemed to me like people who are more likely to succeed in that than is a Jeff Flake, you know, someone who's sort of identified with anti-Trump sentiment in Washington. Um, so just at the basic level, what you're looking for in that sense is there's, there's a baseline where you're just trying to replace Trump with someone who Republicans would vote for who isn't, you know, who's less likely to get us into a nuclear war by accident, right? Like there's a, the baseline problem with Donald Trump is that he is unfit to occupy the office of the presidency. And that's, that's sort of separate from all ideological concerns. And I know that there, there's sort of a tendency among some liberals to say, well, actually, if we got Pence in, it would really be worse because, you know, Pence would set up the Republic of Gilead and the Handmaid's Tale or something, you know, whatever. But, and we would but, all look terrible in those white hats. Or I but feel the blue, I would. the blue, you're, you're, as a married woman, you get the blue dress, which is so, the, so anyway. Um, <laughs> but not that I watch the show or took notes or anything. Um, <laughs> but so there's, there's a baseline where what you're looking for, and not basically I think that's ridiculous. I think liberals should want Mike Pence to be president because the presidency has awesome powers and you want someone who's not Donald Trump exercising those powers, even if you, you know, disagree with them on 16 different issues. Um, so in that sense, if you're looking for an anti-Trump candidate, you're looking for someone who you know, could appeal to Republicans in a plausible way and make a sort of plausible case against Trump. And, you know, the 538 piece was making the point that, yeah, Bevin shares a lot of political, you know, tendencies with Trump and so on, but he's running a halfway effective governorship. He's not sort of destroying his popularity with ridiculous online wars. And he's been sort of effective, effective at sort of compromising or sort of moderating himself on ideological issues where he's out of step with Kentuckians. Um, I don't think Matt Bevin would be a great president in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I think that he, he sort of fits the mold of someone you could dimly imagine beating Trump in a primary in the unlikely event that someone could. Um, then I, I would also say, though, that more, more broadly, as you can probably tell from my back and forth with Megan over class warfare, there is a version of Trumpism that I think would be good for the Republican Party and good for the country. I think the Republican Party needed to become more populist on economic issues than it was. I think it should be more populist going forward. And to the extent that that was a part of Trump's appeal, and I think it was, that kind of, that part of Trumpism, I think, is potentially a good thing. And I think that there are there, you know, in addition to partisan, partisan anger, you know, racial animus and everything else, I think there were legitimate grievances animating Trump voters that both parties should address. So I don't think Matt Bevin is the guy to do that. But if you're just asking me, is there a Trumpism without Trump that could be better for the country? I would say in theory, yes. How you get there in practice, I don't know. Hello, thank you for being here. Welcome to North Carolina. Thank you, um, it's a I'm, pleasure. I'm Janie Wagstaff, and in the deep blue counties of Durham and Orange, I have founded a conservative lecture series. So we're, we're trying to have a different voice We, we here. wish you much success. Well, uh, Bill Adair's been one of my speakers. So we're, we're working on it. Um, so my, I have a bunch of questions with sort of who would be the candidate in the primary in November that could have beaten Hillary Clinton, not whether you liked her or not. Did you think any of them could beat her? 
any of the Republican, any, any of, of the, the non-Trump Republicans. Yeah, yeah, at the head of the ticket, um, who is a Republican conservative in your opinion, whether they'd win anything or not, but like who's, who's a true conservative? And did you feel that the Tea Party was a legitimate conservative movement? And if not, why, or if so, why? And thank you. Sure. Um, I think that, I, I will say that I think I, I overestimated Hillary Clinton among that failure was sort of, you know. You were not the only one. I was <laughs> not the only, well, most, mostly we underestimated Trump's chances. But I think personally, I, I thought Hillary would be a stronger candidate, not an incredibly strong candidate, but a stronger candidate than she was. So at the time, I thought that, you know, it would be, it would be challenging for any of the Republicans to beat her. On the evidence of the campaign she actually ran against Trump, my, I, I think um, Rubio and Kasich would have almost certainly beaten her. And it would have been tougher for different reasons for Jeb or Cruz. You would have ended with Jeb for dynastic reasons and Cruz for ideological reasons. I think Jeb could have beaten her. Could he have gotten the nomination? Simply because at that point you're like, well, Bush. You'd be like, oh, well, Clinton, great. <laughs> you can't really complain on dynastic. It sort of knocks out the dynastic thing. But Except that Bill, that the 90s are remembered. I mean, Hillary, sure. what, where Hillary failed, this is not, this is sort of a separate issue. I was, this sort of is connected to questions about where the Democrats have moved. I thought, I just thought Hillary would capitalize much more on the fact that she was linked to the last period of sort of sustained economic growth and something approaching civic health in, a, in our country. Um, and she wasn't able to, for various reasons, including her own personality, the state of her party, um, and, and the fact that weirdly, this was where Trump's sexual harassment stuff sort of, it, you know, it, it, it hurt the Democrats in this weird way because it reminded everyone of Clinton's in a way that it made, made it harder for Hillary to make the 1990s argument. It, it was such a weird election. But anyway, um, but yeah, so that's, so I, I think Rubio and Kasich in different ways would have had the best shots. Um, in terms of who, who I think of as, I, I think that the definition of conservatism right now is extremely up for grabs, and so I don't think it makes sense to talk about anyone as a true conservative. Like, you know, Trump and Cruz were very far apart in many ways ideologically, and Cruz sort of identified himself as the true conservative in the race. That was his pitch. But now most Cruz voters firmly support Trump, and, you know, it's just, it, it's just not a moment where it makes sense to sort of say, this guy is a true conservative, this guy isn't. I think that the question is more sort of, what direction do you want the Republican Party to go in in the future? And, you know, someone like Tom Cotton would probably take it in a more nationalist direction. And someone like Rubio represents a little more continuity with the George W. Bush era. And then there's sort of places in between and so on. But it's, it's, I think it's much more, yeah, it's, it's much more about sort of where the party goes in the future than who sort of represents true conservatism right now. Um, and the Tea Party was, a, I mean, Tea Party was complicated. Um, I think that it, it, people in our profession had a tendency to sort of want to see it as this kind of sort of highly philosophical thing where it was about the Constitution and it was about liberty and it was about limited government and it was about those things but there was also a chunk of the Tea Party that was clearly just sort of in it for a kind of you know identity politics of the right and that chunk swung very quickly to Trump in the primaries while the more ideological ch chunk stayed with Cruz but again even the Cruz chunk ended up with Trump um, so I, I think we I think the Tea Party was you know it was a perfectly legitimate expression of popular discontent, but its ideological direction, I think, was not quite what a lot of libertarians, especially in Washington, wanted to think it was. They wanted to think it was this great movement for liberty, and it was more, you know, it was like, like the resistance right now, right? It was, it, there's this weird effect where people get more upset about people once they're elected 
And it, like, like the, the, the reaction to Obama got so much stronger once he was president. And the Tea, the tea Party was so much more anti-Obama than Republicans had been before Obama was elected. And similarly, like, yes, the left was very, very anti-Trump, of course, but the resistance has like, taken it to its own level. So some of it in both cases, is just, it's just a, re it's a reactive thing. The Tea Party was a reaction to the financial crisis being followed by this very liberal seeming president. And that was more important than any particular ideological position that it took, I think. Yeah, we have two more questions. Uh, do I have any questions up there? Okay, you, sir. Hi, my, can you hear me? Oh, yep. there it is. Hi, my name is Max. I'm a divinity student. And so one of the funny things that we talk about in the divinity school is the kind of pandering to the pews. And Bush did it so successfully. Uh, we were wondering in 08, you know, they asked McCain, uh, how often you go to church? And he says, eh, not enough. And then Trump famously talks about his favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 3.17, and says the only book that he likes more than the art of the deal is the Bible. Uh, will there be another, uh, will the Republicans bring up and even bother pandering to the pews in the way that George W. Bush did, or is that day over? I don't think it's over exactly. I think Trump has pioneered a different approach, which is to be transactional and to say, you know, you know I'm not one of you, you know I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not identified with you, um, but I'm going to make some specific political promises. I will protect you from sort of aggressive liberalism, and I will appoint the judges that you want. And that has worked. Um, and it's worked in part, you know, there's an element, there's a sort of portion of American evangelicalism that has decided to convince itself that Trump is really an awesome Christian, um, and that does reflect this sort of, this, you Have know. Have you ever spoken to an evangelical who genuinely believes that Donald Trump is a devout Christian? I have certainly My encountered mother. them. I've certainly, yeah, actually, no, I sort of. Wow. It's not like, it's not, you've certainly encountered them online and like, and yeah, no, yeah. I mean, not, not like, it's not that like he's, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, <laughs> but not that necessarily yes. evangelicals would love St. Francis papist, of Assisi. Uh... Right, sorry, but, but it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the idea that like, he's like King David, right? You know, he's a sinner, but God loves him and has chosen him for a great task. And sure, the Bathsheba incident was unfortunate, but, and there was a Catholic <laughs> version of this too, where there were traditionalist Catholics who supported Trump and were comparing him to Constantine. That it was like, you know, Constantine was a bad guy in many ways, and um, but he converted and sort of, you know, did what he did, and that was that was good for the church and so on. So there's there there are these these yeah there, but I, but I, anyway, I think the major phenomenon is this transactional thing. It's that like we ha we tried you know we tried electing George W. Bush, this pious evangelical, to the White House, and you know, we kept on losing the culture wars, so now we're gonna elect a tough guy who we have no illusions about his piety, but he's gonna deliver for us. And in fact, that is the only area of Trump's White House where he can honestly say that he's sort of delivered on his promises, which is a big part of why, even though they were more skeptical of him in the primaries, now evangelicals are sticking, are sticking with him. So that doesn't mean that you couldn't get a sort of more straight, identity-based appeal again in the future. Um, but it was interesting that Rubio and Cruz both provided versions of that, and that wasn't enough. I mean, part of it was that they split it up, right? Like, Cruz got older evangelicals, Rubio got young evangelicals, Trump got evangelicals who don't go to church. And no, seriously, that was the, the core of Trump's support yeah. was sort of cultural cultural evangelicals in the primaries. Actually, and then, in the primaries, like, going to church was one of the best predictors of not voting for Trump. Like, actually going to church, not identifying as a Christian. Within the but, Republican yeah. coalition, within yeah. the No, no, the, within, right. in the primaries, it right. was, it, it But then changed when you get when to, the to the general election, those Cruz and Rubio voters adopted this sort of transactional, well, he's a pagan, but he's our pagan kind of, kind of thing. And that is held. And it will hold unless Trump botch, unless there's another, if there's another Supreme Court nomination and Trump botches it, I could see that breaking. But for now, you know, he's got Pence there, even though he, you know, I think we know what he thinks of Pence. Um, but anyway, 
Yeah, I, I, think, I think going forward, it's a sign of sort of, there is a sense in which evangelicals have decided or realized that they aren't a moral majority. And so that kind of like electing a president who embodies that moral worldview doesn't make as much sense anymore. And instead it's like, well, we're gonna, we're gonna have a transactional politics. We're looking for protection. Although if he violates it, then they will demand right. that unfailingly, that's, right? Because that's right. a credible signal. Yep, where Trump ends up, yeah, if Trump, if Trump is seen as a total disaster and if he fails them on future Supreme Court nominations, I think, yeah, you could imagine a turn back to, we've got to elect the most pious candidate again. And last question, sir. Hi there, I'm Matt King and I'm a senior here at Duke. So I've been reading Plato's Republic for one of my classes and in the, the very first book, um, there's an argument that the reason that smart people get involved in politics is when they are so angry at being ruled by lesser men. And you both clearly think that you're smarter than President Trump. Um, does that ever make you want to put down the pen, put down the word presser, processor, and roll up your sleeves and get involved in the rough and tumble business of politics? I don't know Mr. if I'm, Talbot? I don't think I'm smarter than Donald Trump. Um, or I don't, I, I wouldn't think of it that way. I think I'm more, you know, emotionally stable in certain <laughs> ways. And, um, and I think without thinking that I'm necessarily a good person, I think he's a, uh, not a good person. Um, but I don't think smarts is necessarily the right way to think about that. Um, yeah, the, I did, I did think about that during the last political campaign cycle. Um, I've been, uh, I, um, we have small children and I've been ill actually with Lyme disease for the last couple of years. So that, that made the, um, that made it even more of an absurd fantasy to think about than it otherwise would have been. And I lived in Washington DC for a while and now live in Connecticut, neither of which is sort of the ideal state to mount my distinctive Yankee Catholic convert anti-Trump but pro-populist brand of Republican <laughs> campaign. Um, I have sometimes thought about, I have family from Maine, so that- But you're that, market niche, no one else is in no, that market. I, I, I you're gonna have no 100% one else, including, dominance. Including the voters, yeah. Um, but, but I'll be curious what Megan says. Uh, but I have, I have thought about it without coming to the conclusion that it's in any way something plausible that I could do. I spent a while, um, I, I did speak to a well-known best-selling author um, about who considered a Senate run in Ohio and I was encouraging him to actually run for Senate and he did not. Um, I, I was sort of considering that my, my effort, but J.D. Vance who, who didn't run. Yes. But, but yeah, I mean, you need, you know, uh, I, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's a reasonable question, I think, to ask. Um, I do think that I am smarter than Donald Trump. Uh, I'm willing to say it. Uh, but I also think that like Ross, that isn't the right question for a few reasons. So the first is that in the supreme irony of my life as a libertarian columnist, I'm the daughter of a lobbyist. And one of the things that that has taught me is that our ideas about how politics work are just, you know, the kind of popular conception of, for example, how lobbying works is not at all how lobbying works. Um, I could, you know, it, it was very funny. I would write columns, you know, complaining about lobbyists, and I would get an email, you do know what paid for college, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but in fact, like, money doesn't buy, it doesn't buy you anything big. It buys you access. It buys you the ability to walk in someone's office and pitch them. That's all it gets you. They're not gonna give you anything for money because they've gotta go back to the voters every two years. And so they're not gonna hurt themselves with the voters in order to give you something you want. Small things like tiny tax provisions no one's ever gonna hear about, sure. But any major expenditure, any major change to a policy, no way. And again, on, on regulatory things, AT&T fighting it out with Comcast, like Mothra v. Godzilla, and no one except those two people cares about the outcome. But anything where voters care, Lobbyists do not have the effect that campaign finance people think they have. They just don't and couldn't possibly in a, in a democracy. 
Um, and, but the, more, the broader experience that that taught me is that politics ain't about smart. Um, first of all, it is, um, it's about a certain amount of charisma and the higher up in politics you go, the more it's true. I mean, I remember at the nadir of my unemployment, um, I went down and not and interviewed to be uh, Jeb Bush's speechwriter. Um, and when not he was that, governor of when he was governor of Florida, right. uh, and not because not the not era because Jeb Bush, I think he's a perfectly fine man. I think he was a good governor uh, because I really didn't want to live in Tallahassee. I'm from Manhattan. I had never lived. I've lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, for six months, and that is the farthest I have gotten outside of a of, of a city. Um, but I was surprised when I interviewed with him. Being in a room with Jeb Bush is like being in a room with the sun. You cannot pay attention to anything else as long as Jeb Bush is there. And you like, wouldn't think that with Trump saying he's low energy or whatever, but it really is true when you're in person with him. And the more successful a politician needs to be, the more they have to have it. I don't know what it is, but I do not have it. Um, but also, there, like, I don't. Hey, <laughs> um, I don't think anyone has ever walked away and said, "I was I met Megan McCardle like peeing in a room with the sun," right? Like, <laughs> um, but also that I, I have because my dad was a lobbyist. I have a pretty good idea of what politicians do, right? They do a lot of things that are not my thing. They spend enormous amounts of time hobnobbing with donors and telling them the same thing over and over and over again. It's like being on book tour for a writer, but it never ends. You just go from place to place, and then you spend a lot of time. You don't ever have any time to get, to get smart on policy because you have to have staffs for that because you are running. We expect, our, think about the, just the range of things we expect our politicians to have opinions on. They are supposed to know about fire safety. They are supposed to know about should we do X with North Korea. They're supposed to know about monetary policy. They're supposed to know about everything. And the, and the effect is they know about nothing. You know, they specialize in some areas over time, but they never get as deep as their staffs because they can't because Congress is now doing so much. Um, but also, like, I am not the sort of personable person. When you meet really good politicians, people who are really successful as politicians, these are guys who like, they walk into a room and they light up. They're like my friends from business school. Like I would go home at the end of a long day of hanging out with people who like, oh, thank God, I just, I just gotta, I need like a day to myself now. Like I, I, one of the guys who was on my team, he would get home, it'd be like five minutes, he'd be like, okay, I gotta call someone. <laughs> it's been five minutes, I'm going crazy. I've gotta talk to someone now, right? That's what politicians are like. You saw how Bill Clinton would work a room. You saw the difference between Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, right? When Bill Clinton goes on stage, when Bill Clinton sees a room, he is getting more energy with each additional person he talks to. And Hillary Not is, only energy. Right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Sorry. But, like, Hillary is getting less, right? Her video they made before her convention speech was better than her convention speech. Warmer, more personable, better delivered, all of it. Because Hillary Clinton likes being in small rooms with a few people she knows, and Bill Clinton just wants to meet everyone on the planet so he can love on them, right? Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm it's my it. fault. I did it. I apologize. <laughs> did not, I did not mean I'm... to pick up Ross's innuendo. Um, right? And, and like all of those things are what goes, and, and being a deal maker and doing all of those things, like that's not who I am. I actually have enormous respect for politicians. Um, they, get a, they get a bad rap, and like I'm often the one handing out the, <laughs> the, the, the criticism, but they work. But really hard. But the truth, but for there, what there, they do. there is though, like if you look at our neighbors, Canada, Great Britain, even France, and so on, you get a different style of person. And this sure. goes to the point about sort of campaign finance and so on. You do get more weirdos like us in politics. In and other, if in we other had Western a parliamentary system, right, like if you we would have a be, constitutional You would be convention. the member for Silver Spring. Uh, know, no, no, because no, I, I couldn't. But I couldn't the, live there. the reason, the only. I, I agree with all that. The, the only reason it's, this, this is again a sort of maybe a dark thought to leave you with in certain ways, but like this is, this is a moment in American politics where you have to consider outside the box 
ideas in certain ways. Like, the truth is that Donald Trump, who should not have ever been elected president, got elected president, and suddenly people like Steve Bannon were like sitting, you know, these people who were running a website that other people in conservative media thought was ridiculous six months ago were like sitting in the heart of the Oval Office. And there are two ways you can react to that. You can look at it and say, this is terrible, and we need to get everything back to the way things were as fast as possible. And that's how a lot of people in both parties are looking at it. But I, I think it's a sign that you have to look at things and say, well, this only happened because our system may be in a deeper crisis than we thought it was. And that doesn't mean that you want to elect a New York Times columnist as a senator, well, I think the or, breaking or news here else. is but it, that it does mean that you know you might want to consider people you hadn't thought of before, and you and you yourself might want to consider life choices that you wouldn't have made in a situation where the political system were functioning perfectly smoothly. So when I talk to you know people on college campuses, like people, I think it's it would be good if the Trump era led people in elite circles to widen not only their horizons but their sort of ideas about what can happen in the system, what can change, what can't change, what ideas are on the table, and so on. Um, you know, up to and including running for office in strange situations anyone... that you wouldn't otherwise. Which is why Megan is going to run for governor of Virginia next time. <laughs> she just hasn't been talked into it yet. Or indeed moved from Virginia, uh, which well, I believe is a requirement. Well, that's the first step. Uh, but uh, if it? you are interested in joining the Ross Douthat 2020 Presidential Exploratory Committee, wow. it sorry, will be meeting sorry, 20, upstairs. 20, 20, uh, yeah. There will be food and uh, beverages. But thank you all for being a great audience. And thank you so much to Ross yeah. for coming Thank you, Megan. To... Yeah, let me just just thank you both for uh, taking time to do this. This has been fascinating and um, and also a lot of fun.